There's no stats in this talk at all. And I purge that now because we do all the over modeling, we do all of the maps type work, but it's how you get it out there and how you get it used, which I'm gonna sort of concentrate on as I was asked to talk about. I run a, um, a uh, research lab in about for 20 years, 24 postdocs, two profs, readers, me, six lecturers, three master's courses on all of this work. It's about urban modeling, it's about the Internet of Things, it's about GIS, it's about transport simulations, the flow of crowds, uh, a little bit of BIM, um, sensors, but getting out there and getting it used from a, from a policy maker's point of view. Mainly because research-wise, you have to have um, impact now. And if you're not sort of getting your research out there and used, then when you go for ref and you have your impact to a right, it's a bit hard, hard, hard work. So we've learned quite a few things over the last four or five years that we've taken this path. Not all of it's work, so I've put in some of the bad stuff too. So it's a no holds barred, I don't know why I did some of this talk. Um, arguably we're moving on to the age of smart, which is a love or hate term. Uh, but we're on, on the edge of, there's all this data out there and we're finally un, able to understand, I guess, how places work. We've been talking about this for hundreds of years, but with all of the various data sets, we can finally begin to sort of put it into our software, put it into the various packages we use and actually begin to understand places and spaces. 90% of all of all of the data out there has been created in the last two years alone. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. This is a IBM quote. And I left, left it in here because I thought, well, you know you put quotes in talks, but quotes can often lie to I think it's a complete lie. But there's just, the point is there's data ev ev everywhere. Your mobile phone has got GPS on, but even if it's got GPS turned off, it's pinging back. So we know your location, we know your age group, we know where you've come from, we know lots of things, lots of things about you just because you carry about your phone or you've clicked yes to those terms on whatever app you use. And lots of data is out there just sort of openly to use. There's been a big push, there's been a lot, lot, lot of hype that there's all, all of this op, op, open data that we can use and therefore it's quite big and therefore we can solve world problems like health or crime, which we arguably can't. I think we're coming to the conclusion as a lab that there's an awful lot of hype around this, the word big, the word, the word smart, the internet things type stuff. A lot of hype, but from a research point of view, it is actually moving us on and it's allowing us to simplify things maybe. So um, my background is actually urban planning. It's incredibly dull. <laughs> uh, you sort of go out with friends and you ask what you do, you would say oh you're an urban planner but you do a bit of stats and a bit of GIS and a bit of agent based modelling and no one really cares. No one really wants no, no one really understands what you do. But the open data systems and the, just, just the various new software techniques is allowing us to join up things like BIM, GIS, Internet Things, agent-based modelling, link it into the land use transport systems, and to do a single unified system that perhaps is beginning to work to actually simulate the world around us now. Lots of da da data out there, obviously government pro pro provided data, service data, social media, me media that's that's easy to mine nowadays, and I'll get onto that. Um, open street map data, put this in, just took it in, took it out last night. Open street maps here, because this shows what you can do. Uh, open street map came out of our lab. I sat next to the guy who had that little spark, who was looking for something with that little twinkle. He said, oh my God, you're, you're, you're quite sharp. You're, you're definitely going to do something with this. Uh, he was sitting in our lab just because he just liked our work. He was doing his, his, his end of years at that point. 
and he completely failed them. He flunked the entire course. But we were talking about our work, and we were talking about how to put maps online is just horribly painful. You have to sign your life away, there's legal frameworks you have to do. And what if you just used the crowd to map things yourself? He, he, he left our lab, kept in touch, we run how this system works. And he just set something up which was just people drawing lines on maps at first. This is quite old, it's about four or five years old, so only clip I could find. But they basically mapped the entire world. They just put a call out online and says, look, we currently have to pay for maps, this is daft. Could you just hop on your bike, get a, get a mobile phone, get a GPS un unit, and then share it? And it turns out they have mapped almost the entire world now, and it's open source. So you can do with it whatever you want. There's all networks there, you know where all of the retail units are, all of the nodes are. And the last thing I heard from him, he, he was driving through in his open tops, in his open tops sports car, Southern California, uh, just got married to his new wife, uh, sold his company to Microsoft. There's a lesson there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you, you can do so much now. So we're viewing, the, we're viewing the city as a server, I guess. It's a bit like how the web was 1994. It was a lot to hype, but it wasn't quite joined up. So there's all these feeds beginning to come out there. And it's how we make sense of it now, and how we actually join things up, and how we communicated it. Here's our first example of a live view of town. This is UK-wide, but um, London's the place with the most feeds. And we just wanted to grab a view of places now. Uh, from a research lab point of view, we are heavily census-based. Get all of the census data, come up with trends. But I think there's something about it that if we can move towards a real-time census, just using the open data, the social networking stuff that we have now, it is, of course, flawed. We're not there, but five, ten years' time, this is an early, early, early glimpse, maybe we can do a real-time census of London as it is now. And we wanted it to be something which was something that we did as a lab, but something that worked on iPads and laptops, and for people just to view London at a glance. So naturally, as a lab, we would map things. We would put... Uh, lots of information, lots of graphs, it's just natural for us to, uh, to do. And we've taken a bit of a step back and we've tried to simplify it. It's been a bit academically painful at times because we've simplified it so far that you think, well, there's, there's no research here. But the research is always there behind the scenes, so we archive all of these points and all of these live feeds. And there's a whole number of, of interactive source, sources that you can just actively mine now. And it's becoming relatively simple to put your own systems in place. Uh, the London Mayor uh, had just come back from, um, just come back from uh, New York, and it was Mayor Bloomberg at the time, and then he had a big wall of, this is New York Live. The Mayor rang us up and said, I wonder if you could do us a wall for London Live, but we've got no money. <laughs> yeah, well, well, no, no. But there's that little crack in that door that if you know if you do that, you get your foot in the door and maybe that helps us from an impact point of view and it helps us do good. So um, we're not a lab that makes things. Uh, we're not a workshop lab, we're not architecture and like that. But so we thought, yeah, we can probably do it own I think. So we, we got a piece of wood and 12 iPads and we cut out holes in wood to match the size of the iPad and it turns out that gives you an interactive wall <laughs> and we sort of joined, joined it all up so it's controlled by your mobile phone you can link it up we, we rather cheekily put in a blatant advert for our lab which plays every half hour so I hope he's wandering around town wondering what this CASA stuff is. 
But yeah, it's we just colour coded things up. So green is good, London's doing well, red is bad. Bit painful from an academic point of view. But there's something that therefore we're getting this research out there, we're getting these live feeds of how London works used. And it's an iPad so so you can tap things to view trends, to to view graphs. And then we archive the points. So no point doing all this if you don't actually look at the proper research behind the scenes, which is trying to do the next 30 minutes of an urban system's life. This is what we are really trying to, to do. Um, it's challenging. We're trying to put um, science into the planning system too. So you can go, you know, 30 minutes of an urban life, five years, 10, 10 years, and actually see things more and um, see things shape. And therefore, when, when you archive this, this does become big, because there's all this data out there. And you, you then realize there's so many social networks, there's so many feeds that you can grab, where we can learn about the things that we do to understand how urban place works. The classic one, loads of labs are doing this. I'm jumping back four years now. But lots of labs are doing various Twitter work, it's all, it's all a bit flawed. There's no nature paper, although there have been some, some good research papers out there. But we're not really learning anything that we don't already know. But if we're moving towards looking at how we can mine things from a census in the next five or 10 years time, then these social networks are beginning to grow. But you only get a percentage of a percentage of a percentage. So you only get a very small percent and of that very small percent, we want geolocated tweets, which is another very small percent. So we're not making any grand claims here. In fact, I, I, I think if the next slide is right, then that, that shows that we're not making any grand claims. Um, it's, it's also where this thoughts come about from. So the next slide, I think, is that we were just having lunchtime chat, and we were saying, what if you could determine how much New York is tweeting compared to San Francisco or Paris. And I was showing my age, and there's a clip from a pop group called M, who did a one-hit wonder, 1979. And they had a tagline, which was, So we did Twitter meter which was New York, London, Paris, Munich, and other places around the world, and how much they tweet. But then you realize, oh my God, so I can get everything you say, I can get your timestamp, I can get who it's sent to, and I get your geolocation too. And that allows us to use these sort of new maps. So this is a London Twitter weekend. And if you click yes to those terms, anyone, can basically track and tag you. And I used this in an Oxford talk uh, a couple of years ago. This, this is quite a work, people have been doing this for years now. And I personally left the name tags in. It, it was a research ethics talk. And people went mental, <laughs> absolutely mental. But the point is, anyone can do that. Academically, we clean out all of the names, but you don't have to. It's not in those terms. So here, you can see, we zoom into Heathrow Runway 1, you may not have your phone turned off, and all of these tweets pop, pop, pop up. But this next bit, it flies out, and it zooms into someone's house, and it goes to the back of their shed. And the interesting thing, that when you do that, this just caught my eye, you won't go see the te text here, but someone tweets, happy birthday, how are you, kiss, kiss, kiss. Now, if I was going to tweet my partner or my wife, I'd always do it from the back of my garden shed. <laughs> and it's these sort of things which is, from a research point of view, it's fantastic. Because you've got hyper-local, real-time feeds of what's going on in town. And it allows us to do these new maps. Uh, this is a London 
Twi tw Twitter map, Soho Mountain is, um, is um, <laughs> London's Twitter peak. And it's all worded in a bit of a twee way. So we, we know that we tweet from uh, transport hubs, but that allows us to get us work in the press and as a very small lab, you know, there's only 24 of us. Um, it allows us to sort of punch above our weight, I um, guess. But it is a fine line. It's a fine line between keeping the proper research in place and chasing the impact. Because you don't want to be viewed as a lab that just does tweed stuff. You know, that's not the point. But you can link it to, to, to architecture too. So the ultimate aim is a 3D simulation of place. And we have the place, we have the architecture, we have the heights and stuff. We don't have really the, the live feeds to do the simulation of place yet, but we're moving towards it. And you can, do a, you can do a language search, you probably can't see this, but this is a Twitter language map. You can do this in real time too. So you can see where the language clusters are. So from a census point of view, you can see where certain groups live. Again, it's only a percentage of a percentage of a percentage, but these urban networks and these systems grow. We also have a complete dump of every time you tap in and tap out with um, your card. And this is quite big from a transport network point of view, but we've got no routing data yet. We know we tap in, we know we tap out, but we don't know your routes through the network. So we naturally assume the shortest path turns out, because we've got a quick look, because there's Wi-Fi on, a, the, um, a, on a, the Oyster, Oyster Card network now, so we actually can work out people's routes now. Turns out people do not take the shortest route. They take sort of almost random routes <laughs> across town, which obviously throws the, the next few graphs. But it, it allows us to begin to sort of understand the pulse of place. So we can see where the network begins to light up. Uh, the lights are quite bright, you might not be able to see this clip, but you, yeah, this, this clip's better. So we're beginning to understand flows, and we're using software to visualize this, which is aimed at, aimed at gaming. This is Unity. Unity is fantastic. It's available free of charge. And it allows you to do all the normal academic stuff you do, but on an Xbox or an iPad, or a laptop. And if you're gonna show this to a policy maker or someone who can actually open the door and make things ha happen, we've sort of learned you've often got a 40 second pitch. And if you put a graph up or a table <coughs> or an algorithm, you've probably lost them on the phone. <laughs> but if you show them something shiny first, <laughs> and you know there is science behind the scenes, so we know how all, all of this works. And that helps us sort of move in. Um, it obviously, from a network point of view, it allows us to see how places work. Uh, the the one-label work, this is bank. People work hard all day, first thing, leave at night. I live in Camden Town, which is nightlife. <laughs> Turns out I go to bed just as Camden wakes up, <laughs> such as an age thing. I probably need to move out. But so you can understand the patterns of network, and then you can put, once you know the patterns of the network, you can put your proper urban modeling work in place so you can begin to predict the next half hour. So we have the road network, we have a urban transport system behind the scenes. We know if you shut down certain road points from a half hour point of point of view, where, where the impact will be from a road class, class, clustering. But as an urban planner, I find this a bit challenging. So we've got three new master's courses which I wrote to almost do the course if I was young again. So we teach them how to code now. We teach them how to do the, the the quantitative work and we teach them to understand what the hell it means but we teach them how to visualize it and to push it out to the world as well but as someone who has not taken his own course 
I rely on toolkits to mine and grab things. You know, I, I can't write the code myself. If I did my course, I'd be able to. But we make our own in-house um, toolkits, and this has just launched. And it just allows you to mine wherever you want. Uh, it will fire servers up across the cloud. So you've only got 1% of that very small percentage. But if you fire up 100,000 servers, servers rapidly, collect what you want, then fire them down, maybe there's enough there to make sense of things. And it allows us to sort of begin to mine whatever we want. So all of these APIs are out there. Uh, one of the work, pieces of work we do is bikes. Uh, every time you check in and check out a bike, actually anywhere in the world, that is logged, that is tracked. You could easily grab that feed. We have a world bike map for every rental scheme in the world. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> it's probably just because we can. But this is live. So you can have a live view of where worldwide are all of the rental bikes. But you can play back through time too. So it's allowing people to instantly sort of pattern match. You don't have to load up a interactive GIS system, you've got to do a master's course to learn it. They can sort of do it themselves. Simple pat pattern matching work. And we rolled it out, the uh, Twitter meter went so well, we did a bike only. Uh, but we are actively mining these feeds and some of them, there's little terms that, you know, you know, please do not actively mine our feed. But as an academic lab, you know, you have the slight flexibility to push it a bit more than you would as a commercial firm. There's a few of these which are no longer online because they weren't performing very well. We obviously showed that they weren't performing very well and I got three legal letters in the post that said, please do not let the world know that our commercial bike scheme is not performing very well. You are violating our terms. So they remain up, but they're just not live now. But it is interesting, that's making the point, there's lots of data open out there, but not all of it is really open when you look at those little terms. You know, you can collect what you want from an academic point of view, but whether you can actually use it legally is an open question. question. But you can grab, you know, just simple from a timetable point for you, from a transport modelling system, you know. This used to be like the dreamland. You can now just actively mine the perfect world. So every bus, every tube, every train, every car, every, um, every, every plane, and this is London over time. I'm not sure whether you can actually see it. But you can see how London begins to wake up in a perfect world. And if you've got that perfect world, you've got the real time feed, and you've got the modelling system behind the scenes, you can begin to perhaps move things for, for, forward from a, from a sim, sim, simulation point of view. But not everything works. So the cloud source stuff had a lot of hype over the last few years. I'm getting down just a bit now. We did something called MapTube, which allowed people who weren't able to sort of pattern match with ease just to sort of easily grab whatever census data they wanted and to overlay and mix and match. And we realised it'd be quite good from a survey point of view because we're mapping in real time now. So each of these maps updates themselves on our server in real time. Our first one was on the credit crunch. Uh, this was a Radio 4 sur sur survey. Um, Radio, Radio 4 asked, asked people what, what uh, the impact was like, and we mapped it live. And there was something about getting survey results in live geographically on a map. So we rolled this out further to a tool that the BBC could use. And Look East used here, which, which was our big hit. This is Norfolk. The research is going live in Norfolk now. And we allowed them to ask their questions without our input. This is what they asked. We're trying to get a picture of what life is like across the region, and we need your help. 
If you go to the Look East website and look for our section on antisocial behaviour, you'll get the chance to say what's going on in your part of the world. Of course, this is not scientific, just a snapshot. You have to fill in your postcode and choose one of the options, for example, noisy neighbours. You'll then be able to see a colour-coded map of the region. So far, more than 2,000 of you have taken part, and this is what the map is showing. Red is for drunken youths, yellow for noisy <laughs> neighbours, light blue for boy racers, dark blue for no problems, and green for great community with no problems. <coughs> It's based on postcodes, so just because there's a... So they asked the most meaningless questions ever, <laughs> and therefore the map was meaningless too. Um, so, lessons learned and not everything work. You put systems out there, but people will ask what they want. But there's other data too. We're actively walking people around with brainwave headsets on. To, I'm not a big questionnaire fan after the Look East work. And we can get a raw feed of people <laughs> as they walk around. And this is where I work, this is Tottenham Court Road, and this is a raw feed from the brain. As you walk down Tottenham Court Road, the brain is red, it's a noisy bit of town. So you walk left, it goes blue. This is Charlotte Street, this is coffee, this is lunch. You've got Oxford Street here. You can begin to see what shops light up the brain. And this is adding in to this feed from a brainwave point of view, which is again a bit flawed, it's quite young work, but understanding place. And if you communicate it from a making thing, which we don't, we, we do now as a lab. So this is our London table. This is the same movies I've shown. We project them on a wall. No one would care, really. Everyone just walked by. But we bought a basketball hoop we mounted a short throw projector lens on, and you're projecting down on a piece of wood. It's, it's exact same work. And then suddenly it begins to make it sort of live and people can point at it and they begin to make sense. So it's almost simple tricks which allow us from an impact play, oh my God, the chance, chance, chances coming in to see the work. It's the same work that we just shine on the wall, but because we've used a bit of wood <laughs> and a basketball hoop, the work is impacted and the work is used. I think I'm running low on time. Yeah, a couple of minutes, a few minutes, yeah. So the question is, how do you collect it yourself too? So from a London point of view, there's rules. We do a 3D simulation. I'm not allowed to fly drones from a London point of view. But in Lima, there's no rules. Someone popped into my lab and said, what would you want to do if, 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 if we'd fund you something, just whatever you want? I said, oh, I've got to think about drones currently. Uh, PhD was getting the public involved in, in the urban planning system. Uh, what if we allow people to fly their own drones to capture land use? So we took a drone out to Lima, and it allowed them to collect this massive point cloud. And it is just a point cloud. It's a, look nice but whether they're useful yet but they've captured it themselves and they've got a sense of ownership of collecting the data themselves so we haven't mined them we haven't tapped in their social network fees but it allows them to do high resolution aerial photography and post-it notes turns out post post-it post notes work and pens the future may well be the pen <laughs> <laughs> and that works and it allows you to collect data and, and thought and allows you to 3D print as well. So if you 3D print and project back down, this is the same GIS data that we collected. But the 3D print is from the drone they threw themselves. And there's something about moving the planning for real system, which is what it's termed, um, into the sort of the drone type world, from the drones for good. Because soon there'll be personal drones say about London will probably ban them but there'll be places where you'll be able to grab things and you can understand how places work and sort of see things from the past too augmented reality comes in there so you're gathering all of this data this is a system called layer which allows you just to point your phone where everybody can create their own fantastic augmented reality experience. and view the Our data reality is while you're out there it's where the real world is combined with digital. We're going to bring these digital experiences into reality. 
and kind of engage into reality with this new music. So you literally just point your phone. It knows where you are, it knows where it's all tagged from, and it overlays it. Today with Leia you can experience history, art. ATM find a real estate for sale. How things looked uh, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Forsberg clearly. Tourism, sports, commerce, gaming, social. Gaming in augmented reality is a completely new job. Interacting with objects right in front of you. You know, we got the crazy shit on there. <laughs> <laughs> so I did this, my friend, I downloaded the app, I went to Ham Ham Hampstead Heath actually. And I had the phone and I was running on Hampstead Heath and I was pointing at where where you could see the house prices and the bus. But there was no arm around my shoulder and a little smile. <laughs> she, she, she just looked at me and said, Andy, you're a sad little man. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but, so things don't always work. The augmented stuff is not quite there yet, but you can use it to sort of communicate things. This is our Hyde Park in the box. So we've got an urban sim simulation of the park. Point your phone at it. Bit of a 3D print, and the park pops out, and these live feeds come out. So this final five minutes, it's just slightly different ways to communicate live feeds. There's something about holding things and moving away from the laptop screen or the wall that you project on to get the same work used, but then get the same work seen. Um, I'll skip past this. But then you can go a step too far. We did a pigeon simulator as a lab. Uh, this was because we were playing about with movement sensors. And this is arguably what our lab is now known for. It was in the 2012 games, it's been shown on the One Show, it's been on ex ex exhibitions around the world. And it's a pigeon sim simulator. It's not what I want my research lab to be known for. <laughs> But you can fly through live feeds, and you can pan, and you can zoom, and you're getting the data in there. And from a classroom point of view, or a public exhibition point of view, you're communicating the normal data that we show in all of these conferences. But we don't, we're just communicating it in a slightly different way. But it's in a 3D, 3D space there, and it's perhaps fun. So the word fun is often frowned upon Ac academically. And then the Oculus Rift landed on my desk six months ago. It's a virtual reality headset which is out in shop, so in about six months' time. Potential to cause the fall of the Western world. <laughs> it transports you to a completely new space. Uh, so we did a urban roller coaster for a um, London show. We have blatant adverts for a lab on. The most pointless thing, <coughs> academically, we have ever done. But you can begin to get the live feeds in here too. So we're going to put London in here next. You have an urban roller coaster around London, you've got the real-time transport, we know where the clouds are, we, we uh, know where the networks are, we know where the tweets are. And it's just a different way to communicate things. There's a left and right view, because it obviously goes on your head. When it's on your head, of course, though, you look a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it does allow you to, to, to build worlds. <coughs> we can build worlds and we can put our geographic data into these worlds. And I'm on my last two slides now. And then we're playing about with sand too. It's, something, it's the same concept. But this is a urban sim, sim simulation where you can light things, you can make things burn. And normally it would be a GIS system, it would be a Java-based fire simulation. But just with a webcam is pointing up, is picking up the light from a, the light from a, the, from a lighter and laser pen, you can project it onto sand. Because people you know, put their hands into sand and put their glass of wine or their cup of coffee around things, you've suddenly got them. You've, You've sort of got them rather than having to run a Java app that didn't work and just a little thing that moved across your um, laptop. So we're finally moving towards, this is our next two years' work. This is, this is not ready yet. Moving towards a 3D real-time London with all of this in place. So we've got a 3D representation of the whole of the UK now. 
we've got all of the transport network in there now, so we've got real-time transport times. The aim is to put the urban modelling in place and to begin to begin to use a software toolkit which shows the UK now, the UK in five years' time, the UK in ten years' time, and to be able to tweak things, but to be able to sort of do easy searches too. So if you're looking from a land point of view and you know the planning law and you know it has to be a certain floor height. <coughs> so to join up the Internet of Things with BIM and GIS in a way that doesn't use any of those terms. So trying to simplify the entire thing. But there is still science behind the scenes. And that's why I end my talk. Thank you very much. Who's got questions here for Andrew? Okay, we'll start at the back there, don't you? Um, fabulous talk. Uh, I'd love to pitch into the nature of the sandbox thing. Thank you. Um, so I'm based in Liverpool, and a lot of what you've shown is centred around London, yeah, it is. where it seems like uh, open data has just made a lot more progress than other places. Yeah. What, what's your view of other, other places? What's your experience? Um, all, all of our, our, I try to make our work UK wide, but it is one of those things because we are London based, we just almost naturally do yeah, London. Yeah. But a lot of the software works UK wide, so you can click on other places, but there's just not the feeds out there. Mm -hmm. And I think London has got the most feeds currently, but almost those feeds are beginning to get locked up, the terms are beginning to change. So I'm slightly worried that we've almost hit a peak. This is what the open data dream could look like. And all know, we, maybe we can make money from this. Yeah. And those terms are beginning to shift. So I'm hoping most places will be like London as is now in five years, 10 years time. But I think the questions that you have from a policy maker point of view, when you sit in a room with the guys in suits who own the GIS data or, or their legal team and you say can you give this away free there's always there's always a few found and those found seem to be getting larger because they need to get money back for all of the data they've gathered so i meant i meant to aim on an upbeat theme but i think realistically I think the data may get less in the short term okay any other questions there Thank you, at the back there. I have a similar point, but it was more of actually a lot of this is about city and urban things. What yeah. can you see and what's your view about how these types of things can be used more in rural settings? It is very urban based, but that's really just because that's what our lab does. But it's it's perfect from a rural point, point of view, maybe for putting in impact of wind farms or new build housing or line of sight type work so it's probably urban based because that's that's the hard bit if it works from a london point of view it should work most places a, a around the world but our system is made to work uk wide so rural and town any other views on data availability in other cities or any other kind of comment or any other questions for andrew here I'm happy to ask more questions, but I don't know whether it's polite. Oh, well, should we go for the guy just behind you first, then back down to you? That's right, okay, so... Don't come on the back there. To what extent can you encourage the sort of citizen data collection that you did in Lima, hmm. in Britain, across all sectors? Because that gets around okay. the problem of people wanting to monetize the data, and it gets also around the problem yeah. about rural about rural data feeds or small provincial town data feeds where they don't want to, the, the authorities don't want to fund it. Yeah. Um, it's something that I'm very keen on, something that when I was many years ago I wrote my, uh, my, um, my, um, my, um, my um, research PhD on uh, 10 years ago. Um, we're doing stuff in, um, in London now, which is more sort of community-based, but 
it is harder. The UK is harder to get that buy-in because everyone thinks that they that you want something from them, and therefore it it becomes just like a it's it's we haven't really moved on from the planning for real from the 1970s viewpoint yet, and it needs a bit of a shift. Lima was just a natural joy. They were just happy to help and map from a from a UK point of view. It's not quite there yet. It almost needs. Yeah, you, you almost need to offer people like club card points to take part in things because this is what people are used to now. Yeah, of course I take part in the future of my urban planning as long as I can get 20% off a cappuccino down the road and that sort of stuff. That sort of nature is there. So I'm finding it harder than I thought I would, honestly. Okay, and now, Ian, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I was interested in your reference to OpenStreetMap. Hmm. Um, I use OpenStreetMap for various things. Yeah. An experience I've had was trying to extract the rail, the rail, rail, rail network from yeah. the data. Yeah. And now you start to see inconsistencies in exactly how it's encoded. Yeah. I wonder what your experience with that is. It's, it's, it's not perfect, but it is quite young still. So. There's a lot of people working on it be behind the scenes. There's a lot of, lot, lot of research papers out there about what's right and what's wrong. But it's a lot more perfect than having yeah. to sign your life away to a national mapping a, a, a agency and then realize you can't actually use it online and that sort of stuff. So we're not there yet, but we're not far off. It's interesting, we had a similar experience with looking at um, uh, Wikipedia and using that as a data source. Yeah. Variations in exact ways of encoding yeah. mean that it's not as good as it could be. Yeah. It's hard to see how to fix it. Yeah. Okay, and one last question at the back there, thank you. Um, do you find this is an area that uh, Google is doing more in? I noticed that they're doing more real time data in there and search results. They are. They've just set up their, their own city lab. Bless them. <laughs> Turns out they've got more money than research councils, probably in the entire world. So yes, they can see money in these feeds, because your phone, whether it's an Android or an iPhone, pings them every two minutes, and they know where they are, where you are. If you go to there's a website where you can view your own tracks for your last month and it knows where you've been and therefore they, they can ping you adverts based on where you've currently been. So yes, they are actively looking at this. Yeah. They started doing um, football in shops, you can see yeah. um, you know, when's the busiest period for Marks and Spencer's in Ealing. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. So the interesting thing from a research point of view is that when the big companies move in, and you know, you know, they've got the resources to solve it. As a research lab, do you then move on to the next big thing that they haven't thought of yet? And wait for someone else to commercialise it? So lots of potential there, lots of potential issues too, but certainly an area that will be of research interest and I think interest in many people in the room for many years to come. Yes, yeah, Good. certainly. So on that note, thank you very much for Andrew for his talk. Uh, thank you very much for